Μάλλον θα έλεγα να σε ευχαριστήσω πάρα πολύ για αυτό που κάνεις για μένα. Μην ξεχνά ότι εμείς εδώ ζούμε, είμαστε μια μικρή επαρχία, ε, ολόκληρη Ελλάδα, μια μικρή επαρχία στον πλανήτη της γης. Λοιπόν, εγώ σκέπτομαι αυτή την ώρα και ορισμένα άλλα πράγματα, ότι σε πολύ δύσκολες στιγμές οι Έλληνες της Αμερικής βοήθησαν πάρα πολύ την Ελλάδα, ιδιαίτερα στα χρόνια του πολέμου του 1940, ήρθαν πάρα πολύ εδώ και πολέμησαν. Και ακόμα και παλιότερα, δηλαδή στους Βαλκανικούς πολέμους του 1912-1913, ήρθαν από την Αμερική Έλληνες, οι οποίοι δυστυχώς επήγαν και εκεί που δεν γυρίζει κανένας πίσω στον κόσμο. Αυτό δεν το έχει ξεχάσει κανένας. Ε, ήταν μια δωρεά που έκαναν οι Έλληνες της Αμερικής. Αυτή τη στιγμή, ιδιαίτερα, που περνάμε μια πολύ δύσκολη κατάσταση, θα ήθελα να παρακαλέσω τους Έλληνες της Αμερικής τουλάχιστον να μας συνδράμουν ηθικά. Δηλαδή, να μας δίνουν Θάρρος, να μας βοηθούν ηθικά, όχι υλικά, γιατί παραπάει το πράγμα να είμαστε πια όλα τα χρόνια με το χέρι απλωμένο και να ζητάμε βοήθεια. Ηθικά τουλάχιστον, πλέον να καταπάρχει να κυβέρνεται στην Αμερική και στα άλλα μέρη του κόσμου, αγαπάνε την πατρίδα μας διπλά από μας. Λοιπόν, αυτή την αγάπη θέλω να την στέλνετε, δεν ξέρω πώς θα το καταφέρετε, να γίνει γνωστή αυτή η αγάπη στο τελευταίο χωριό της Ελλάδας. Ευχαριστούμε, Μανώ. Θέλω να σε ρωτήσω κάτι για, μας, για τους Έλληνες της Αμερικής. Ναι. Η αλήθεια είναι ότι όταν ζει κανεί σε μια χώρα που η πρώτη γλώσσα δεν είναι τα ελληνικά, είναι δύσκολο για αυτόν να αγαπήσει και να, και να μοιραστεί τραγούδια με πιο, δι, με, με πιο, βαθύ, ε, με, με πιο βαθύ στίχο, πιο, πιο βαθύ νόημα και πιο δύσκολη γλώσσα από ότι πιο ελαφρά τραγούδια, πιο εύκολα. Γιατί πιστεύεις ότι έχει αξία να, α, να μένει κανείς κοντά στο, στην, στην πατρίδα του μέσω της γλώσσας και μέσω της ποιήσης. Μα η γλώσσα είναι η πατρίδα μας. Τώρα, εάν ένα τραγούδι ακουστεί περισσότερο, ε, δεν είναι μόνο τα λόγια, είναι η μαγεία της μουσικής. Τα λόγια τα δικά μου, αυτά που κάναμε μαζί τουλάχιστον, μπορεί να είναι καλά, θαυμάσια κλπ. κλπ. Εντάξει, εάν δεν ήταν η μαγεία της μουσικής που έβαλες εσύ ο ίδιος στους στίχους, τα τραγούδια θα ήταν νεκρά, θα ήταν λόγια μονάχα. Ενώ η μουσική που έβαλες ήταν ό,τι έπρεπε για αυτούς τους στίχους, ειδικά. Σε ευχαριστώ, Μάνο. Σε ευχαριστώ πολύ. Για αυτό θα όχι μόνο που μου έκανες την τιμή να μου κάνεις στίχους, να μου μελοποιήσεις στίχους, αλλά το ότι πέτυχες πολύ περισσότερα πράγματα από όσα περίμενα εγώ. Να είσαι καλά, να είσαι καλά. Θέλω να σε ρωτήσω και κάτι άλλο. Ναι. Διάβασα τα μαύρα μάτια, το βιβλίο που έγραψε για τον, για τον Μαμπακάρη ναι. και, για τον, και για την Σύρο στην οποία μεγάλωσε, που ουσιαστικά είναι μια ιστορία του ρεπέτικου, αλλά και ολόκληρου του ελληνικού τραγουδίου. Τώρα τι ετοιμάζεις μετά από αυτό. Ε, αυτό το βιβλίο μου κράτησε πάρα πολλά χρόνια να μαζεύω το υλικό για τον Μάρκο Βαμπεγάρη. Ήταν ένα τάμα που έκανα στον εαυτό μου. Δεν 
τον γνώρισα, δεν μπορώ λοιπόν να τον γνωρίσω, αλλά μάζευα το υλικό όλα αυτά τα χρόνια και βγήκε το βιβλίο. Είναι κατά κάποιο τρόπο η περιραίουσα ατμόσφαιρα της σύρας της περίοδου 1905-1920. Αυτή τη στιγμή βάζω μία τάξη στα χαρτιά μου, ετοιμάζω, έχω κάτι ορισμένα πράγματα που θέλω να τα αξιοποιήσω, δεν ξέρω, με έχει πιάσει και μία έτσι νοσταλγία για τα παιδικά χρόνια και θέλω να τελειώσω μια σειρά που είναι εκεί, εκεί πραγματικά θα πω ότι είναι θαυμάσια αυτό που κάνω. Τι είναι, αμέσως θα σου πω. Μην νομίζω ότι έχω καβαλήσει το καλάμι, αλλά πρέπει να το εξηγήσεις στους Αμερικανούς τι σημαίνει αυτό που είπα. <laughs> ε, ετοιμάζω παραμύθια έμετρα για μικρά παιδιά. Ωραία, ωραία. Ευχαριστώ να τα διαβάσουμε λοιπόν. Και είμαστε έτοιμοι να, να, να παίξουμε τα τραγούδια της δουλειά μας. Ξέρω ότι θα μείνει κοντά μας και θα τα ακούσεις. Σε ευχαριστώ ωραία. πολύ που, που, που ε, κάθισες μέχρι τέτοια ώρα ξημερώματα Ελλάδας για να είσαι κοντά μας. Σε ευχαριστώ εγώ ίδιος προσωπικά για τη μεγάλη τιμή που μου έκανες και τη χαρά. Σ' αγαπώ πολύ, σ' αγαπάμε όλοι και είμαστε έτοιμοι να σε τραγουδήσουμε. Ευχαριστώ να Oh, you. 
The Greek passion for traveling, for both knowledge and adventure, began long ago with Odysseus, the paradigm of the eternal traveler, with Herodotus, the first tourist and most famous storyteller, and with Pausanias, who wrote the first travel guide 2,000 years ago. Tourism, an idea created by the Greeks. Tourism in Greece is a heritage of pilgrimage. For the mind, Athens, the philosophers. For the body, 
Olympia, the Games. For the Spirit, Delphi, the Oracle, Delos, the Mysteries, Epidaurus, the Drama. For life, as the poet Constantine Cavafy said, as you set out for Ithaca, hope that your road is long, full of adventure and discovery. In 1914, a visionary Greek statesman, Eleftherios Venizelos, founded the first national service for the organization of Greek tourism. From that point forward, the number of visitors, travelers, and pilgrims to Greece's ancient monuments and therapeutic hot springs began to increase. Greece's fame as a tourist destination now spread around the world the 10,000 tourists of 1914 became 17 and a half million in 2014. Tourism indeed left an indelible impression on the early history of modern Greece. But the miraculous place and the timeless values remain the same. The light, legendary, dazzling, luminous, soft, tangible, infinite, spiritual. The land and light transform us as we journey. The land, each place so unique, so different, so special and so close. Places that express a mysterious divinity. The mountain, heavy with snow. The sun, sparkling on the distant sea. Undulating sea of olive trees. Sugar cube villages tumble down mountains to the sea. Beaches of breathless beauty. The Aegean Islands, archipelago of dreams, stepping stones of summer. Temples, castles and churches, not dead shrines to the past, but reminders of how Greeks have responded and still respond to this unique and miraculous land. And the values too, the land's most precious inheritance, beauty, measure, proportion, and human scale show a balance between man and nature and make visible the dimensions of the heart. Hospitality, Greece's oldest art form. Long ago, Zeus showed his love of strangers by walking among men disguised as a common traveler. Since then, hospitality has been an important part of who Greeks are. Music, dance, food and friendship, never far away. These things are always shared. Festivals and feasts and random outbursts of celebration. Human, intimate, comfortable and friendly. And the concept of luxury is redefined. An aristocratic grace, ease and simplicity. Art and ideas and philosophy and songs and love fit the tempo of Greek life and arise spontaneously from this special land. The traveler to Greece discovers these qualities at every turn in a rare combination of heart and mind, simplicity, warmth and authenticity. Greece, a piece of heaven on earth.
welcome to Discovering Orthodox Christianity. I'm Stacey Spanos, your host for this series of programs designed to explain the basic teachings of Orthodox Christianity. We're honored to be filming at the Holy Cross Chapel on the campus of Hellenic College Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology in Boston. So in today's program, we're discussing the early church from the beginning through the ecumenical councils. Our guests for today's program are Dr. Demetrios S. Kados, Dean of Hellenic College and Professor of Religious Studies, and Dr. James Skedros, Michael G. and Anastasia Cantonis, Professor of Byzantine Studies and Professor of Early Christianity at Hellenic College Holy Cross. So we've turned to the experts. Thank you so much both for joining us. Yes, Dr. You. Skedros, let's begin with you. Take us back to the very early days of the church, the time that Jesus was there and establishing the church. How did people receive him in his time? It's a fascinating period because not only is Judaism thriving in Jerusalem and in the, in the surrounding areas, but it's expanded um, around the Mediterranean within a larger Roman world. Jesus himself didn't travel much outside of Palestine, probably never left Palestine. Most of his ministry was in Galilee, and then he ends up down in Jerusalem towards the end of his ministry. He's steeped in the Jewish tradition. He's steeped in, in the traditions of, of his forefathers and foremothers. Um, but he has something different to say. And his message as recorded in the Gospel of Mark, uh, you know, a repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's how the Gospel of Mark starts out. And Jesus has a message of establishing this kingdom of God on earth. What did that mean? And he has followers. And then all of a sudden, he dies. But he resurrects. And now what do his followers do with this? So it's not just that he had followers early on. The question now becomes for his followers, what happened to our leader and who was this person? And what could say that Christianity, and I know that we may have a chance to talk about this in a minute, that Christianity is really a response to who Jesus is. And, and the Orthodox Church has a particular, not just view, but a, a particular complete expression of that. Uh, and our history is filled with trying to respond to that question. I know that we'll get into that discussion most likely. We certainly will. So some people call the Orthodox Church the ancient church. Is that phrase, is that word desirable? Is it used correctly to describe the Orthodox Church? It's certainly accurate. Um, it is a church that has a direct line of continuity to the earliest um, ministry of Jesus Christ. So we know that the churches, for example, in Jerusalem, in Antioch, uh, the churches in Corinth, uh, in Thessaloniki, uh, they have uh, a connection that goes back to the very earliest um, disciples of Jesus, to the, the brother of uh, Jesus, James, the brother of the Lord, uh, to uh, Peter, the chief among the apostles, uh, St. Paul, the uh, greatest of uh, missionaries uh, of, of the church. And uh, the churches that were established in those regions um, continued uninterrupted uh, to the present day. So yes, it is the ancient church. Um, but being the ancient church doesn't mean that it remains static. It's a dynamic living entity. And I'm the same person uh, that emerged from my mother's womb, but I look very different today than I did 40 years ago. Uh, so the church is very much you know, uh, the same reality. Uh, the church is a, an organism that is growing. It's dynamic. And uh, in time and in history, it changes. Uh, yeah. I like the way you put that. Dr. Skedros, let me ask you, because this yeah, goes hand in hand sure. with this next question. Is the Orthodox Church the same as the one in the Bible? Yes and no. <laughs> it's a complicated question, obviously, but certainly theologically and even organically, as Dr. Cato's used this example of birth and now who he is today, it's a great example in the sense that the church has an origin, but it doesn't stop with that origin. It continues. It's an organic institution. It's a divine and human institution, and in that sense, as a human institution, it can change, but not change its essence. So absolutely, Christ establishes a church. Uh, he is crucified. He resurrects. He ascends. The, the apostles meet 50 days after his, uh, after his um, uh, resurrection at the day of Pentecost, right? And so they receive the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit. And some people say that the Orthodox Church begins on Pentecost. I often like to tell my students here at the seminary and the college that the Orthodox Church, you could say in some sense, begins, but it begins a new chapter on Pentecost. It never divorces itself from 
the time and life of Jesus, and even before Jesus. It can't divorce itself from its Jewish roots and its historical roots in Judaism. And so in that sense, Pentecost is a moment. The compilation of New Testament texts is a moment in the life of the church. And so without a doubt, the Orthodox Church is a church of the, of, of the New Testament. Does it look exactly the same? Absolutely not. Does it have the same message? Yes, it may be articulated a bit differently. So how is the, how's Christianity at the time, how was it influenced by its proximity to the Roman emperor, empire at that time? Uh, well, I think the most important thing to recognize is that uh, as the uh, Christians move out from their original um, context within Palestine into uh, the um, spheres that are very deeply Hellenized uh, by um, Greek and Roman culture, this is all part of the greater Roman Empire in the Mediterranean world, um, they uh, need to find ways to accommodate themselves to the local culture. They need to find ways in which they will um, adapt to the local culture, and they need to find ways in which they will uh, limit and synthesize what they find in the culture. So uh, we find uh, Christianity that moves um, north and west into the Mediterranean world looks very different than Christianity that moves um, east or south, uh, further into Asia or down uh, into Africa. And, and, and um, that's the, the, from the Roman Empire, influencing That's right, it. And exactly. It's uh, the adoption of language. You bring in Greek, that suddenly brings in a whole host of issues in terms of uh, philosophy, in terms of spirituality, religious understanding. Um, you have Roman laws that influences the ways in which the church is being organized. Um, there is uh, the issue of art uh, that is, um, over time, over uh, several centuries, is adapted uh, to Christian purposes. These give Christianity a very distinctive look, and it really raises a number of questions about how should Christians adapt to uh, their setting, to their, to their contemporary context. And something that obviously we'll have to deal with as Christianity continues on into the future. That's exactly right. You believe right. it will evolve differently from what it is today? That's exactly right. I think the reason why we're interested in the early church specifically is to see what was the spirit that guided them in making these kinds of decisions? Um, because as we move forward, um, we'll need a spirit of discernment to know uh, what is an appropriate degree of adaptation and accommodation. We're in a new context. In the 20th century, um, orthodoxy moves into the West. We have churches in the United States, in Australia, in Western Europe. Well, how should they accommodate to the local culture? They can look back to the earlier church for lessons in terms of how that could be done. Let's talk about the, oh, I'm sorry, you wanted to say, say something. So one, it's one of the challenges uh, that Christians face and historians of Christianity face is that Christianity is a historical religion. Christ came, uh, the incarnation occurred at a particular historical moment, and it happened to be the time when the Roman Empire um, is established in the Mediterranean world. And there was a famous church historian in the fourth century, Eusebius, who made a theological argument, and he said, God chose the perfect time for Christianity to be established, for Christ to come, because the Roman Empire had this great sort of peace, and we had one emperor, and so there must be one God, and Christ comes, and the Roman Empire was at peace so that Paul could go ahead and move throughout the Mediterranean world to establish Christian churches. That's great, but it historicizes the message of Christ sometimes, and sometimes we as Orthodox tend to pick historical moments, focus on those, and say, oh, that's who we are, and as Dimitri, greatly said that Christianity expands even beyond the borders of the Roman Empire into areas in Africa, into areas in Asia that were outside of the Roman Empire, and even into areas north um, of, the, of the line of the Roman Empire in Great Britain. Dr. Kados, let me ask you this question. Let's talk about the ecumenical councils, and that's a term that may be foreign to some Orthodox Christians, those who are not really knowledgeable about their faith. What is an ecumenical council? What does ecumenical mean? If you don't mind, I'd rather back up with the question of what is a council, and sure. then we can look at what sure. is an ecumenical council. So uh, the church from as early as the very first apostles, we see in Acts 15, uh, recognized that when a challenge uh, would arise uh, to the question of how one is saved, uh, they would meet together um, and the Holy Spirit would guide them. When two or three are gathered in my name, Jesus says, there I am with them. So the, um, the disciples, uh, came together, the first disciples, the apostles, they came together and they said it seemed good to us and to the Holy Spirit to respond to the questions in this particular way. So it became a practice uh, in the church's life 
for uh, the bishops, the leaders, the supervisors uh, of their churches, respective churches, to come together to address address questions um, that concern salvation and the pressing question of who is Jesus Christ. So there are many, many councils that are convened over the course of the church's life. Now, in the year 325, we have the Emperor Constantine convene a council uh, at the expense of the Roman Empire, which raises church-state questions. Um, at the expense of the Roman Empire, he convenes a gathering of bishops from throughout the known world, throughout the empire, throughout the ecumeni. So that's where the term ecumenical comes from. So there are bishops from as far west as the Straits of Gibraltar to as far east as uh, Mesopotamia that come together in the city of Nicaea in the year 325 to debate the very pressing question of, is the Son of God fully, truly God? So it was called ecumenical because it was an ecumenical gathering. Over time, we recognize that a council that is truly ecumenical is not ecumenical simply because it has representation from all parts of the world, but because the theology promulgated at the council is truly ecumenical, is truly universal, and a, a, a fundamental tenet of faith for salvation. You know, those of us who are not extremely knowledgeable about that part of history, hear emperors and you think of all the movies that you've seen where it was all about plundering and the war. Why did Constantine call that council? What was he after? I think I'll defer to you on this one. <laughs> it, it seems he, the question of whether or not Constantine had a real conversion to Christianity is very difficult to answer. We don't know what was in his heart. We know he was baptized on his deathbed, um, but he calls his council while he's still a pagan. He's not, well, he's, still yeah, a he's not, a, he's not, a, he's not baptized. So the question is why, and why? it's a great question, yeah. right? And it seems that Constantine had a conversion experience around 312 AD um, before he sacked the city of Rome, not sacked it, but took over the city of Rome. And, uh, and at that point, that conversion sometimes can be interpreted, Christians interpreted it, and he later interprets it himself as a vision from God, uh, from, from the Christian God. And it seems from that time on, even perhaps a little bit earlier, he was sympathetic towards Christians. So some people have looked at Constantine and said he calls the council in 325 as a political move to keep the Christians who are now battling over this question about whether Jesus is fully divine or divine or just sort of semi-divine, what kind of a God is he? And he calls it to kind of unite the Christians. Others argue that, yeah, that's probably why he called it, but in addition, he was probably, although not a baptized Christian, had a close affinity Almost in some sense, I like to answer that question in terms of Constantine had a call and not so much a conversion. It seems like he had a call to Christianity, to serve Christianity, even though he hasn't been baptized yet, but he hasn't really quite converted. And what was the population mix back then, if you can speak to that? How, how many were Christians at the time? How many were pagan? I'm, I'm assuming yeah. there were other religions mixed in as well. Well, numbers from antiquity are notoriously difficult to really determine, and anything you read in contemporary scholarship is really based on guesses and estimates. Um, but the, the Christians were a minority population, uh, but they were an increasingly visible minority population. And uh, if I can add to some of the comments of, um, of uh, Jim, the, the conversion of experience of uh, Constantine led him to um, extend patronage to the church in very significant ways. He built churches, he um, uh, passed legislation that uh, regulated the life of the church. Um, he also uh, involved himself in these theological questions, um, probably not in a very intimate way. I don't think that he fully understood what the concerns were, but he recognized that the Christian church was being torn apart by the very pressing question. I think this is really what we want to focus on, that the very pressing question of who is Jesus Christ? If he is the Son of God, is he truly, fully God? Or is he like God? Is he a God? Is he something of a God? And um, the church um, proclaimed uh, that Jesus Christ is fully God. Everything that we understand by the term God um, is to be applied to the person of Jesus Christ and more. He is what the Father is in His very being, in His very essence. But 
then the question continues because Jesus Christ came and lived among us. And so he's not just God, he's also fully human. So subsequent councils dealt with that reality. What does it mean to be fully human, to be fully divine, to be God and man living among us? And that was determined at the Council of Nicaea, isn't that correct, that he was fully human and fully divine? So the, the Council of Nicaea was the council at which the church proclaimed him as fully God. That was in 325. In 381, we have, after a series of many other councils that were also proclaimed to be ecumenical, we have another very important council that's held in Constantinople, um, which is today recognized as the second ecumenical council, where the fullness of the divinity of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, um, are both recognized, and the Trinity is recognized as being fully God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one God. So, Dr. Skedro, some weighty issues were decided at these councils. There was another one that dealt with Theotokos. That's right. Explain what happened at that one sure. and so some of the other Sure, so there were two other highlights. councils in the 5th century following upon these two in the 4th century, one in 431 and 451, continues the debate about the relationship of the divine and the human in Jesus and that title Theotokos gets in the mix in part because if you call Mary Theotokos, which means the bearer of God or the mother of God, um, then you really ask the question, can she as a woman, as a human being, carry and bear God? What does that mean? And so then the question becomes, who is in the fetus of Mary? Is it God? Is it just a human being? When does Jesus become divine? Does he become divine at conception? Does he become divine at some point later on in his life? Did God, did God reach down at some point when Jesus is in his ministry and say, now you have divinity? And so that gets really hammered out. And, and the Orthodox response is, is finally sort of articulated in 451 that, yeah, from the very beginning, from the very beginning, the divine logos enters into Mary at conception. She provides the flesh upon which, which kind of enfleshes the Logos, and together as one, right, as one, it's, I don't want to be crass, but they come out together as one in the birth sure, canal, sure. and there's, but it's at the very, very beginning. Most Christians believe that, and even today will accept that, but how it got articulated in the language, oh, there were fights, so it didn't stop. We had to have two more councils in the fifth, in the sixth, and seventh centuries to hammer out the language over what is that relationship between the human and divine and Jesus. Uh, Dr. Cato, go ahead, please. I just want to uh, step in here for a second because I think this issue of ecumenical council is very important. So um, Jim mentioned the 451 council. Uh, there was actually a council in 449 that the church brought together to right. say, this is an ecumenical council. Right. We're having an ecumenical council this year. And um, they proclaimed actually something quite contrary to what we believe today. Uh, and it was uh, over the course of the next uh, two years that that council had come to be known. It was first uh, described as such by the Pope of Rome. Uh, that was not an ecumenical council. That was a council of robbers. So uh, <laughs> we have a council in 449 that's proclaimed to be the third ecumenical council. And yet we have, uh, I'm sorry, the um, fourth the fourth ecumenical council. And then you have in uh, 451 another council this one's the real ecumenical council, the fourth ecumenical council. And there's been a number of ecumenical councils over time. The Orthodox Church recognizes seven of them, That's right. but the Roman Catholic Church recognizes how many? 22, I believe, 21 so, or 22. So uh, at what point do these lose their meaning? Do we need more ecumenical councils, one that unites all of Christianity, or can the Orthodox have their own and the Roman Catholic have their own? Well, the purpose of an ecumenical council, or the reason why a council is proclaimed as ecumenical, rather, that's the better question, um, is, is to say that at that council, something was proclaimed which is absolutely essential to our salvation. So there's a tremendous amount of wisdom in the church saying these seven councils are ecumenical. Other councils are important, they're um, they might be critical to answering certain issues that arise at a particular time, but at no time has the church come together afterwards to say these are truly universally applicable truths um, to subsequent councils. So I think we would want to be very careful of proclaiming too many councils as ecumenical before somebody else steps up and says that's a council of robbers or at least a council of people who don't know what they're saying. They're saying and when was the last one for the Orthodox Christians? Right. I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, it, it was the seventh council in 787 and as we're sitting in this beautiful chapel I'm looking at these images, these icons 
on the icon screen here. And it was that at that council, which was dealt with theological issues, but it really dealt with the major question of are icons appropriate for veneration? Can they receive veneration by you and me? Can we burn a candle? Literally, that was one of the questions. Can you burn a candle in front of an icon? Can you burn incense in front of an icon? And what does that mean to do that? And in fact, in 754, Constantine V, the Emperor Constantine V had called the council, called it ecumenical, and said, no icons. And that stood for 30 years, 20 years, whatever the, whatever the math is. And so is. why did they go back on they that? They went then? back because the church felt very strongly, the people felt, and leadership in the church felt that what he was saying and what some of the bishops at that at the council were saying was anti, was the antithesis of what we understand the incarnation to mean if god took on flesh in the person of jesus christ and people in palestine in the first century a.d saw him why can't we paint an image of him at number one and number two if god took on flesh that means in some theological sense matter can be sanctified and so not only did the council of 77 say that Yes, we can venerate images, but we can venerate the saints' relics. Well, what were they concerned about? Were they concerned about paganism? Sure. Burning a candle, sure. incense in front of an image? Is that, is that what they were worried about? These were serious concerns, and we have to remember that in the 8th century, you have a changed context. So um, we, although it's still declared to be the Roman Empire, it's actually a much smaller state that's now surrounded by a very powerful uh, empire, uh, which is dominated by a, a different religion, so the rise of Islam uh, in the 8th century, um, and its incredible success in uh, conquests from uh, one end of the known world to the other, um, raised the question of whether or not a religion that was an iconic, a religion that forbade uh, artistic, <clears throat> excuse me, representations, um, was right. So there was a, a questioning, there was a crisis of faith, and there was perhaps some excesses as well in terms of iconographic uh, programs and uh, the celebration or the use of material uh, in uh, worship. But ultimately what the church recognized was that um, Mary is Theotokos because the one who came forth from her, Jesus Christ, is none other than the Son of God existing humanly. And if God chose to come into this world and to save us, through the matter uh, of this world, then that process continues. We consume the flesh and the blood of none other than God himself incarnate. So the, um, the Eucharist, the celebration of the Eucharist, the celebration of baptism using water, the chrismation with the use of, of ointment, um, of oils and myrrhs, uh, all of these speak to the ways in which the world does not obstruct our access to God, but is actually the medium through which we, as created beings, can bridge uh, with the spiritual world, that we move towards God through materiality, not by removing ourselves from it, but by sanctifying it, by making it uh, holy. Dr. Skedros, what do you believe is the most important event in the early church? I'm sure there were many, yeah. but if you could only pick one. Uh, so I'm going to answer that. I'm not going to quite answer your question, but I'll try. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, that's a nice classic. try. Professor yeah, that's right. Move, that's right. <laughs> Instead of event, how about we say events? In the sense that, uh, in the sense that all these events matter. They do matter. In that we are historical. Christianity is a historical religion. Whether you're a Protestant, a Catholic, or an Orthodox, it's a historical religion, and we all have to deal with our history. And we as Orthodox have a long history, 2,000 years to deal with. And so the, the events of the first thousand years influence who we are today in really important ways. The Council of 787, what if Christianity had stopped at 681 and defined the person of Christ in some pretty cerebral theological terms, which those six first councils did, and then decided that images are not good? The whole aesthetic of the Orthodox Church would be totally different. Sure. And so 787 is really important but is it more important than Constantine calling the first ecumenical council? Is it more important than St. Paul making, having a conversion experience on the road to Damascus and then taking that conversion experience or that call, I should say he's not converted, but that call and doing something with it? Wow, I don't know. Yeah. How about you? I'd like to follow up with that too. I'm going to support the comments that he made in terms of, um, you know, this is a period uh, in which we can um, learn a lot about uh, how a church can or uh, should function. I mean, from 
uh, the very earliest disciples uh, through the end of the first millennium. We have a church that struggles with a number of different questions, a changing historical context, and the responses of the church are different in each time, which then requires that we look at our own contemporary circumstances and say that, well, we need to be just as kind of adaptable and sophisticated in our discernment of how we can continue as a church today. And we need to recognize that the church uh, adapts, um, places limits, says certain things are not acceptable, but then also creates something new. And uh, we see that happening, I think, several times. There are several of these cycles within the first millennium alone. I know we're talking about the early church, but how, how do we decide some of these pressing issues today? if we don't have ecumenical councils? Well, I, I would say, if uh, you want me to take the lead on that one, um, so uh, councils could be convened, um, and then it is uh, for the church to determine whether or not those councils were truly ecumenical. So um, the, the real questions that require uh, sort of the convening of a council would be far more pressing than just m minor administrative matters. Uh, administrative matters were addressed at these councils, and it's very significant for us to go back and look at the canons that address those administrative matters. But it's really the theological questions that um, are the most pressing. And their acceptance is always by posterity, and it's by the whole church. So, so it's later on. How many years later? Could be anywhere from half a two. generation to two <laughs> generations. It could be two anywhere years, from two right? years <laughs> right. to, uh, to generations. I mean, there, there were, as I said earlier, there were many, many councils convened between 325 and 381, each of which was intended to be an ecumenical council. And in fact, some of them had a better claim to being ecumenical insofar as they had real widespread geographic representation. The Council of Constantinople, which we call ecumenical today, in 381, had only 100 or so bishops, 150 bishops, uh, most of them from Constantinople and uh, a large minority from, uh, the, uh, from Egypt, the Church of Egypt. That was it. How did they discern, decide what was ecumenical for the entire church? It was because of what they proclaimed was recognized subsequently as ecumenical. And Dr. Skedros, let me end with this last question. Do you believe that the Orthodox Church is overly focused on its history, on the past, since it's such a rich past? Are we doing enough to be concerned, looking ahead of, towards the future? As I said earlier, the past is really important, but the present is, in some sense, even more important. Because you and I, Dimitri, all of us today as Orthodox Christians, as Christians in the world, we're called to live a life in Christ. And yeah, we build on what has gone on in the past. We are part of an organic church. We are part of a tradition um, that keeps us rooted. But what do you and I do with the kingdom of heaven that is at hand. Right. What do we do with it as a church, but also individually? And, and uh, our saving grace is, because we are human and we're frail, our saving grace is our belief in the power of the Holy Spirit. That Christ sent the Spirit at Pentecost, and he said, I'm going to give you the comforter, the Spirit of truth. And he, or the Spirit, and it's neuter in Greek, the Spirit will guide you. And we believe that. And so we feel, so I think as Orthodox, yeah, we need to look at the past, but we can't, we can't objectify the past in a sense and say, oh, it's the second century that is the true Orthodox Church. No, it's the eighth century that's the true Orthodox Church. No, the true Orthodox Church is today as we live in, live in the spirit. Dr. Cato, do you agree? We would have to be very careful to not uh, somehow um, reify theological formulas, to not, um, uh, isolate a particular period in the life of the church as the only normative period in the life of the church. Uh, I think every, um, every generation of the church has lessons that we can draw uh, from it, uh, both positive and negative, and then that's the guidance that we have to move forward. Right. So the reason why we studied history is because we felt that by understanding our past, we would be able to negotiate the present uh, better and move towards the future. Fascinating discussion. We appreciate the time that you've both you given much. us today. Thank you so Thanks. much. Thank you. Thank and I invite our guests to log on to our YouTube channel for more programs in this series. You can find us at youtube.com slash Greek Orthodox Church. I'm Stacey Spanos. Thank you for watching.